So now we're going to go to the second type of pain sensitivity, and that's neuropathic injury. Neuropathic injury is so cool because it's an injury that can then result in pain transmission or nociceptive transmission without any type of input at all. So the inflammatory pain we just talked about sensitized the nerves so that a small painful stimulus would now become very painful because it was amplified. Now we can have damage that creates pain that's coming out of nothing. So the first thing that we're going to have is an initial peripheral nerve injury. So we're talking about neuropathic pain here. We're talking specifically about peripheral nerve. So I am going to produce an injury to a major nerve in your body. This is probably not going to be cutting your finger, but usually neuropathic injury is going to be through a more major nerve pathway or nerve bundle. And you can crush it, you can cut it. There's various types of injury that can occur. But imagine the first time you get that injury, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have action potentials. You're sending that pain and you're going to get that initial pain signal. Now you have a neuron and that's fine. You had injury, you get an initial pain signal, but we're going to turn that into chronic pain. It doesn't always occur, but sometimes if there is enough damage to that neuron and it responds in this unfortunate way, then it's going to respond to that injury by upregulating several different proteins. It upregulates the sodium channels. So now action potential transmission is increased. It's also going to upregulate those TRPV1 channels that we talked about before. And those here, let me do that, TRPV1. And those were the ones that are activated by substance P or by heat. Those aren't even normally on these neurons. So now not only are you adding more sodium channels, you are adding pain receptors or nociceptive receptors that weren't even there to begin with. You're going to increase the number of voltage-gated calcium channels presynaptically. So basically all these changes are occurring that's going to increase transmission of action potentials. And so the problem is that you can increase these so much by upregulating them so much that now you don't actually even have to do anything to get pain. And so these guys can just be firing spontaneously without ever even needing to touch the nerve or anything. And we call that ectopic firing. Ectopic means spontaneous. And so someone with neuropathic pain can say, I'm just lying there at night, my arm's just lying on the bed, and there's just shooting pains going up my arm, like unbelievable pain constantly. And it's not coming from anywhere except those pain neurons deciding to fire. So how'd that happen? We had that initial injury that upregulated several channels, including sodium and calcium channels. That causes peripheral pain neurons to be hypersensitive. So even the ones that aren't firing spontaneously are going to be more sensitive and fire more likely. And then you've got ones that are going to fire spontaneously with ectopic firing. So now what the problem is that once that peripheral injury heals, you've still got this pain. And depending on your genetics, on the extent of the injury, those changes that have occurred in those neurons, that could go away in a few months. It could keep going for years. So people have very different amounts of time that they could have neuropathic pain. So what were the reasons had to have an injury, just like the inflammatory pain had to have an injury, something that started it. We had that upregulation calcium channels, both the presynaptic voltage-gated channels and TRPV1, which are only on these pain neurons. We've got upregulation of voltage-gated sodium channels and other changes. But all of those are doing is causing more depolarization to the cell and making it more likely to produce an action potential and to transmit the action potential until you can reach the point where it's transmitting an action potential without anything coming in and starting it. So what kinds of drugs could we use to help treat neuropathic pain based on what we know about the pathophysiology? So we know that we have TRPV1 activation and that's a calcium channel. We know that we have voltage-gated calcium channel increase. We know we have voltage-gated sodium channel increase. We also, when we talk about neuropathic pain, and we'll talk about the mechanisms of this really soon, we do actually have some sensitization that occurs in that central spinal synapse. 
as a result of the overactive firing in the neuropathic injury. And so we'll see why we can also use NMDA receptor blockers here, but we'll talk about why those work later. So based on these three pieces of changes that are occurring in neuropathic pain on these three ion channel types, what drugs do you think that we could use to help treat neuropathic pain? Well, the first one could be anything that's a voltage-gated sodium channel blocker. And the second thing could be anything that's a voltage-gated calcium channel blocker. And so you're decreasing here the activation of that nociceptive neuron. You're decreasing the likelihood of action potential propagation, and you're decreasing the release of neurotransmitter presynaptically. So what are some of the voltage-gated sodium channel blockers that we know? We've got local anesthetics. We've got tricyclic antidepressants. And I'll remind you in a little bit that those are very dirty drugs. Because tricyclic antidepressants have sodium channel block, we can have sodium channel blocking antiepileptics like lamotrigine, otherwise known as lamictal. And so all of those are going to block voltage gated sodium channels to some extent. So we could also use a voltage-gated calcium channel blocker, and we've got calcium channel blocking antiepileptics. We've got pregabalin. And we also have one that we're going to talk about really soon, which is capsaicin. And capsaicin is the ingredient in hot chili pepper oil. And so those are going to act, that capsaicin acts at those TRPV1 receptors, which are normally either only activated by heat or substance P. We can also activate them through capsaicin and desensitize them so that we can no longer get signaling through them. So let's talk about capsaicin. Capsaicin is, as I said, the ligand for TRPV1, one ligand for TRPV1 receptors. TRPV1 receptors are naturally activated by heat, they're naturally activated by substance P released in our body, and they're activated by the ligand capsaicin. And TRPV1 receptors are really only found on pain neurons. Because these are primarily on heat-sensing neurons, when these receptors get activated, it activates that heat neuron, sends a signal up to your brain that says that's hot. So that's how you sense heat. If you activate the receptor with something else like capsaicin or red pepper oil, then the same neuron is going to get activated and it's going to go up and tell your brain that that's heat in the exact same way. So the reason that we find wasabi and mustard and insect venoms and various different things to feel hot to us is because they're all activating this TRPV1 receptor and those neurons are just telling our brain that that's heat. So there were a couple places you could have those TRPV1 calcium channels or receptors. You had them out on those peripheral pain neurons, on the nociceptive endings of heat neurons, or you could have them there in the spinal central synapse as part of the substance P signaling. So when we look at targeting a drug for the TRPV1 receptor, it immediately sounds like a really bad idea to activate it. Because if activating that TRPV1 receptor is either going to make things feel like you're burning or acting in here, increase the signaling of all types of pain, then this just sounds like a terrible idea to do. The reason that we use an agent that is a TRPV1 channel activator, capsaicin, is because it's so strong that it actually desensitizes and turns off the receptors. So you're going to have that capsaicin receptor, you're going to bind capsaicin to it, it's going to activate the receptor, so you're going to get all of a sudden this really strong, painful heat stimulus, and then that receptor is going to desensitize and now you no longer get any signal at all through it. So by desensitizing the TRPV1 receptors, we're gonna actually decrease the firing of these pain neurons here. 
By decreasing that firing, we're going to cause analgesia or pain relief for people who have overfiring of those peripheral neurons, which is usually people with neuropathic pain and people with arthritis where there's inflammatory issues coming down here um, in the joints that's causing increased signaling. So we have one drug that we use for that, and it is a capsaicin patch called Cutenza. There's also a lot of OTC capsaicin agents. The adverse effect for these is that when you put it on, it hurts. There's a burning pain, and that's going to last for a little while before the desensitization kicks in. Luckily, the desensitization lasts a long time, so you can apply it once, it hurts, and then you're good for quite some time. Over-the-counter products, they're not strong enough to cause significant pain at the beginning, but the Cutenza patch with 8%, that is pretty hot. And so a lot of times they'll put down a local anesthetic on the area, then put down the Cutenza patch so that while that is being absorbed and activating those trp one receptors, you've stopped the transmission of pain through that neuron, allow the trp one receptors to desensitize, and then when the local anesthetic wears off, now you're in the state where you want to be. Using a patch on a local area of a neuropathic pain, using a patch if you have pain in a very specific area, has some benefits of avoiding systemic side effects. So remember capsaicin is a v one calcium channel agonist activator, but it's so strong that it excites and then desensitizes those v one channels. So if you're asked about mechanism of action, you need to know that the mechanism of action molecularly, it's an activator, but then it desensitizes. It's not an antagonist. In really extreme cases where it's left applied too frequently, it can actually cause degeneration of nerve endings that have v one receptors on them. So that's that's a nasty thing. And it can actually also be anti-inflammatory where you're putting it on because it can inhibit cyclooxygenase 2 activity as well as some other free radical generation. So when we talked about neuropathic pain, we talked about using capsaicin for those trip v ones We talked about sodium channel blockers, including lidocaine and including some types of anti-seizure drugs. Antiepileptics. And we talked about how tricyclic antidepressants also have some sodium channel block. Then the third thing we talked about were kind of basic voltage-gated calcium channel blockers, uh, anti-epileptics. So here, it's good to remind you that tricyclics are used because they have very specific properties, and the antidepressants are not all the same. If you go back and you remember talking about SSRIs are very clean drugs, they just block CERT. SNRIs block both CERT and norepinephrine reuptake transporters. And then tricyclics block CERT and norepinephrine reuptake transporters, but they also have a lot of other activities. So they're pretty dirty drugs. They have H1 antagonism, which so do several others. They have muscarinic antagonism, which gives them more side effects. They have alpha-1 antagonism, more side effects. And they have our sodium channel blockers. So when we think about antidepressants, we think of monoamine oxidase inhibitors as pretty hardcore. But we also think of TCAs as having a lot more adverse effects than SNRIs and SSRIs. But again, dirty drugs, sometimes it's actually beneficial to be less specific. So why would a TCA that has a sodium channel block be helpful for neuropathic pain? That's because one of those methods of increasing activity of the nociceptive in neuropathic pain was that we upregulated sodium channels. And then we had more firing. So blocking that sodium channel helps.